speaker. We have Ben Markley. Ben is a junior and he's majoring in philosophy. Uh, ben took a philosophy course as an uninspired freshman at Johnson County Community College in Oberlin Park, Kansas, and never got a break. In fall of 2013, he transferred to Boston College to complete his undergraduate studies with the goal of pursuing a doctorate in the future. On campus, Ben works as a staff editor for BC's undergraduate philosophy journal, Dianoia, and teaches philosophy courses for BC's Flash. His current research involves evaluating the ethical aspects of beginning of life and end of life issues, particularly procreation and suicide. So without further ado, here's Ben. All right, I don't really have a personal intro prepared, so we'll just hop right into this, uh, if that's okay. Um, let's see, yeah, okay. So we live in a society where we highly prize the idea that everyone has a right to their own opinion. Uh, the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights is about this. It's about freedom of speech, freedom of ideas. And we, we are so into this idea that everyone has the right to their own opinion that a philosopher named Harry Frankfurt at uh, Princeton has made this observation, that there is a widespread conviction that it is the responsibility of a citizen to have opinions about everything. That's not just that people can or people might have opinions about everything, that's that they have a responsibility, that we feel like we have an obligation or even a duty to have an opinion. And I think one place in our culture where you can see this is comments. Uh, it, just about anything on the internet, anything you can find on the internet, you can comment on. You can comment on a news story, you can comment on a YouTube video, you can comment on your friend's Facebook status about what they had for breakfast, anything. And it's this comment box is saying to you, you know, your opinion is important, please submit your opinion. And if you look at social media, this is the idea. If I put up a picture and you're not able to comment on it, that's not very fun for you. Or if you put up a picture and I can't comment on it, then that hardly seems to even be social. The idea of social media is that we're all uh, intersecting our opinions and, and bouncing off of each other. And so we can see that this idea that everyone has a right to their own opinion and everyone's opinion is important is extremely prevalent in our culture. But my question is, is opinion enough? Or do we have an ethical duty, maybe not a legal duty, but an ethical duty to aspire to something higher than just an opinion? And really this goes back to uh, a philosopher named William Clifford, uh, English philosopher from the 19th century, which you can tell because they don't make beards like that anymore, uh, unless you play for the Red Sox. Uh, and he, he's not very well known in the philosophy world except for one essay that he wrote called The Ethics of Belief. He's kind of a one-hit wonder. Um, and in The Ethics of Belief, he argues that there is an ethical way to get to a belief and there is an unethical way to get to a belief. And he has lots of examples for this, but uh, the example I'm going to use, let's say you're on a jury. You're presiding over a murder case and they bring in the accused and he looks like this. Uh, once you see that guy, your first instinct might be, that guy's guilty. There's no way that guy didn't commit the crime. And we might agree with you that this guy looks sketchy, but we would also say that the way you reach your conclusion is unethical. The job of a juror is not to just have instincts about things. The job of a juror is to examine the evidence and follow it to its most logical conclusion to come to a decision. And why? Because, well, I mean, even, you might even be right about this murder. You might be right that this guy is a murderer. Your instinct might be correct. And since we live in a system where you're innocent until proven guilty, it might be that once you look at the evidence, if the evidence isn't conclusive, that you're going to let this guy go, even though he actually did it. But our system believes that it is better to come to an incorrect conclusion in an ethical way than to come to a correct conclusion in an unethical way. And why? Because this guy's life is on the line, and justice is on the line, and the victims are on the line. You can't just make decisions like this based on how you feel. There has to be a reliable method, even if it's not 100% right all the time. So there's a sense where you can get to a belief ethically or unethically. So if we take a, uh, an issue like abortion, let's think about the consequences. What's on the line with abortion? If you think abortion is morally permissible, and it turns out that it's not, then you're condoning the murder of thousands upon thousands of lives. On the other hand, if you think abortion is not morally permissible, and it is, 
then you are condoning the needless oppression of thousands upon thousands of women and men. Uh, and it doesn't seem like you can just make these kinds of decisions based on what you feel or what you read in an article one time, something, some flimsy opinion like that. And why? Because, well, your beliefs are going to affect what you say. They're going to affect what you do. It's going to affect what your kids grow up to believe and what they do. It's going to affect what your friends believe. It's going to affect what your family believes. And now that we have social media, you can make a Facebook status or a blog or whatever, and that can affect people all over the world. And since you have that ability, that power to influence people, uh, it seems like you should, you have an ethical duty to come to as good of an opinion as you can possibly get to, not just one you feel right off the bat. So after, uh, after figuring that out, you might say, well, that seems like a lot of responsibility for one person. Um, I'm going to take another road. I'm just going to say, you know what? I don't know about abortion. I don't know. Um, and a lot of us do this. Election year. I did this. Last, uh, last election. Uh, I did not vote. I'm not proud of that. I wish I did. But I didn't. Because really, it's, election year is a depressing time. Everybody's really tense. Everybody's kind of getting at each other. It feels like half of, the, half of America is like Nazi Germany. You know, it's like, it's like it's, I just, I, I hated that. And I was like, you know what? I just don't even want to be a part of that. I don't want to be involved. I don't want to watch debates. I don't want to look at the issues. I just want to step out. Not going to vote. Not going to be informed. And I thought that by doing that, that somehow I was removing myself from the moral hot seat. I was taking pressure off myself. I wasn't responsible for what was going to happen. And the question that comes from that is, is that true? Does ignorance relieve us of moral responsibility? Maybe, probably not. Why? It goes back to a guy named Aristotle. Aristotle said there's more than one kind of ignorance. There's excused ignorance and there's culpable ignorance. Excused ignorance. If I cut the brakes to your car and your brake light shorts out, and I short out your brake light, and then you go and drive your car and your brakes go out and you get in an accident, that's not your fault. Uh, that's my fault. And it's not your fault because you couldn't have known that I was going to do that. You had no way of knowing that your brakes were going to go out when you drove that day. That's excused ignorance. Then there's culpable ignorance. Culpable ignorance means you can be blamed for it. Um, so let's say that your brake light's been flashing at you for about three weeks. Uh, you might have driven your car several times and not had your brakes go out. And you might have thought then that, well, you know, I've done this a lot of times. Maybe this time it still won't go out. But then let's say you get in an accident. You might say, well, I didn't know if my brakes were going to go out. And we might say, yeah, but you should have known. You should have known better. And that's the idea behind culpable ignorance. Ignorance that you can be blamed for. That it is in your power to know better. Or as William Clifford would say, you had no right to believe that your brakes were not going to go out. You should have checked your brakes. So that's great. Now we know that there's culpable ignorance. But how do we know culpable ignorance when we see it? There's a lot of uh, literature on this right now. One philosopher at Rutgers named Holly Smith says uh, that to have culpable ignorance, you need what's called a benighting act. And what's a benighting act? Uh, in her words, in her wonderful systematic philosophical words, uh, a benighting act is when you consciously fail to improve or positively impair your cognitive position, which is a lot of words. What that means, we can compare it to getting drunk. Uh, when you get drunk, um, you are putting yourself in a position where you might, while you're drunk, do things you would not otherwise do. Do things you were not expecting yourself to do. And in that sense, you might say that those things that you did while you were drunk, you weren't really in control of. You weren't really, uh, you weren't really making that call. But you were making this call. You made the decision to get drunk. And when you got drunk, you put yourself in a condition where you knew you were going to be making those kinds of decisions. So let's say you're alone and you get drunk. And so you go out driving, you get in an accident. You might say, well, that wasn't my fault. I was drunk. I didn't know what I was doing. Well, we're going to say no. You're not responsible in the same way a sober person is responsible. If a sober person runs a red light, we assume that they're aware of what they're doing. If a drunk person does it, they're not aware in the same way. But we're going to say that you're indirectly responsible. To be indirectly responsible, there's got to be something you're directly responsible for, in this case, getting drunk. So culpable ignorance, the benighting act, that is when you choose to be ignorant. That is the choice you make. And because you make that initial choice to be ignorant, everything that follows from that choice is something you are responsible for. So that is culpable ignorance. 
Um, and by contrast, we can look at a guy like Huckleberry Finn. I would say Huckleberry Finn is not culpably ignorant. Um, in, the, in the book, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, one of the main uh, subplots is that Huck is helping a slave named Jim escape. And we think that's a great thing for Huck to do. That's so good. Well, there's one person who doesn't think it's great, and that's Huckleberry Finn. Huckleberry Finn feels guilty that he's letting a slave go. And we can see it in this quote. Uh, this is him talking. Conscience says to me, what had poor Miss Watson, the woman who owned Jim, uh, done to you that you could see her slave go off right under your eyes and never say one single word? What did that poor old woman do to you that you could treat her so mean? I got to feeling so mean and so miserable, I most wished I was dead. That is a guy who does not have good views on racism or slavery. This is a guy who clearly doesn't know that slavery is a bad thing. But it's hard to blame him for that. We can say that what he believes is bad, but how he came to that belief, this kid grew up in the pre-Civil War Deep South, embedded in the slave culture. Not an educated guy, doesn't have a lot of abolitionist newspapers where he's from, how would he have known any better? I would argue, not everybody would agree, but I would argue that this is excused ignorance. Take us, in contrast to Huckleberry Finn. We have this. Most of you, probably, I can't because my phone is not fancy, but most of you can probably get each one of these things beamed to your phone right now. A lot of it for free. This is a lot of information. This is access that no generation has had prior to us. And this is, with all this information that you have instant access to, it seems like if you're going to be ignorant about an ethical issue, you're probably choosing to be ignorant about an ethical issue. And again, choosing to be ignorant, that's culpable ignorance. That's ignorance you can be blamed for. And you might say, well, well okay, okay, I get that. I can be blamed for my ignorance, but what's so bad about it? Let me put it like this. Going back to abortion. Like we said, two, two potential outcomes here. Either thousands upon thousands of lives are being murdered or thousands upon thousands of people are being oppressed. Now, if you're, say, a pro-choice person, so you, you believe that abortion is morally permissible, um, you're over here. And if you're wrong, then you are uh, condoning the murder of thousands upon thousands of lives. But nobody thinks that you, in being wrong, that you wanted this to happen. You aren't like, oh, I really hope that, uh, I, I'm going to believe this because I want to condone thousands upon thousands of murders. No, you're thinking, this is false, and so I'm going to be concerned about the people being oppressed over here. So while you may be wrong, your intention at least is good. You are trying to get to the truth, or at least do what you thought was right. But when you say, I don't know, you're really saying, I don't care to know. And to go even farther, when you say, I don't care to know, what you're really saying is, I care more about not being wrong than I care about this or I care about this. And that, that does not, I would argue that that does not seem ethical to me. And I don't think it would seem ethical to any of you. So, this takes us one step further. There's one more duty we need to talk about. So we've established that you have a duty to come to, come to the best conclusion you can on the best evidence you can find. But there's one more part of this. Let's say you have two friends who look a little creepy, look a little soulless, but that's okay, because um, that's all the PowerPoint had. Um, you have friends blue and red, and they're walking along and they find a gun that, unbeknownst to them, is cocked and loaded. They don't know anything about guns, so blue picks up the gun because blue's a moron, and points it at red and is pretending, and he pulls the trigger, uh, just kind of messing around, and the gun goes off and shoots red. That's a bad situation. Uh, but, you could argue, Blue's probably not responsible. He may be excused of ignorance because he doesn't know anything about guns. Um, but let's say you're walking by this situation. You're purple. Um, and you see this happening. This conversation would not happen. You would not say, um, well, you might say this, Hey, Blue, what are you doing? Well, uh, we found this gun, and we're just kind of messing around, and I thought that, you know, I'd just pretend to shoot at red. Oh, well, do you know if it's, like, loaded or, like, cocked or, like, anything like that? No, not really. I, I, don't, I don't know anything about that. Oh, okay, then. Just carry on. Like, 
That would not be your reaction. Your reaction would be more like, hey, you might want to check the gun or put it down or something like that before you shoot somebody. Why? Even though that blue might not be responsible for what he's about to do, that's not what you're concerned about. You're concerned about red. Because whether blue knows what he's doing or not, red is going to get shot, and it's going to hurt a lot, and he might die. That's what you're concerned about. And so even though this guy might be ignorant, he might not be able to be blamed for anything he's doing, you're going to intervene because you care more about red, the consequence that will happen to red, than the moral responsibility, abstractly, of blue. Why do I bring this up? When you have gone and done your research about something, when you have looked to form the best possible opinion you can about something, and then you look and you see someone acting or speaking in a way where it seems clear to you that they do not know the same information you do, I would argue that you have an ethical obligation to go tell that person the things you know. You have an ethical obligation to be like, hey, like, did you know about this? Or hey, I don't know if that's actually true. And we're uncomfortable with this. We're uncomfortable with this because we believe everybody has a right to their own opinion, and we're a culture of tolerance. And tolerance is great. Here's what tolerance is not. Tolerance is not living in your fortress of solitude with your opinions that are your opinions and nobody's going to touch your opinions and nobody's going to tell you what to do. That's not tolerance. Tolerance is not just staying out of each other's business. That's indifference. Tolerance is that when I go over to this guy and talk to him about shooting or whatever issue we're talking about, I don't say, hey, you believe this or I'm going to beat you up. That's not tolerance. Tolerance, though, is me saying, hey, I want you to know about this, and you can disagree with me, with me if you want. You don't have to listen to me. Um, and you know what? If you have better information, I'm willing to change my mind, and I'm willing to hear your side of it. It's having a respectful and civil discourse. It's not just not talking to each other. We need to talk to each other because we all need to have the best opinions we can. Why? Because there are real consequences to these ethical problems. There are real reds out there. So wrapping up really quick, this is kind of a geeky thing on my part. This is called an interrobang. And you've probably never seen something exactly like this before. Um, this was invented in 1962 by an advertiser. And he invented it as a new punctuation mark to be used um, for exciting and urgent questions. Uh, and it didn't catch on. It didn't stick. It got on a few typewriters, but it did not catch on. It kind of died away as a fad. And I'm sad about that. I'm sad because I think that every ethical question we ask should have an interrobang at the end of it. Because these questions are urgent and they're exciting. An ethical question, questions like, is abortion OK? What about capital punishment? Should homosexuals have the right to get married? Things like this, these aren't things that we just muse about. These aren't things that we contemplate at our leisure. These aren't things we sit around a campfire and feel deep in intellectual talking about, or post on Facebook to feel good about ourselves. These are real things with real consequences that we need to be talking about as if they're real, because they are. And in that sense, they're urgent. But they're also exciting. When someone comes up to you, when you're the blue in this situation, someone comes up to you and says, hey, I do you know this? Like, I think you might be a little misled here. Usually that's a very uncomfortable situation and you want to get defensive about that, I do. Um, but you should be excited because between you two, if you do this well, talking about this, you're going to come closer to the truth, closer to solving the problem or to better understanding the problem. So do you have a right to your own opinion? Yes, absolutely, 100%, America, God bless, like, yes, you do. But you also have an ethical duty to have the best possible opinion you can and to share the information you have with others and to listen to other people when they share their information with you. Because ignorance is bliss, sure, but awareness is better. Thank you.